Samuel Sweek is the campaign lead on the Music for the Many campaign at the Peace and Justice Project. We're going to be discussing that campaign, which is trying to protect music venues across the country. But before we delve into any of that, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by you today. Samuel, how are you doing? Hey, not too bad. Thank you so much for having me. Not at all. Thank you for joining us. So let's dive right into it then. Um, can you talk our, th our viewers through what the Music for the Many campaign is trying to achieve? So the Peace and Justice Project has launched Music for the Many um, sort of in response to a series of economic challenges that our country has faced. So that be be it the 10 plus year, 13 years sorry, now of austerity and cuts we've had from the Tory government and the coalition government, um, the pandemic, which meant that live music venues, uh, and bars and, and sort of our hospitality venues and such were not able to operate and open. Um, and of course, uh, now the cost of living crisis, which is impacting directly uh, the sort of uh, disposable income of literally everybody in the country. Um, and in response to that, music venues in particular who have already faced these significant challenges are struggling even more so just to stay afloat. They already operate on incredibly tight profit margins. And the aim of the campaign is to raise awareness of those challenges. We, we will soon be setting out a series of demands to the government in terms of arts and live music funding, um, but also, you know, promoting uh, that that level of inclusion within people's within communities to go out and see live shows um, to support their local economy. Um, that's what Music for the Many is about. It's an inclusive campaign, and we're happy to be taking along with us as, uh, trade unions, community groups, and uh, supporters up and down the country. We've had a fantastic response, and we look forward to the next steps. So you talked a little bit there about the economic conditions that venues are facing, but what are some of the other threats that music venues at the moment are hit with? So really, the minute there's the large challenges they face, and most of that is generated from the uh, the decimated income they have faced over time, uh, is the need to pay their staff to pay their staff fairly, um, which of course all workers deserve and should have. Um, because of the incredibly tight profit margins, it's becoming difficult to meet those commitments. Um, the other challenges that they are facing is the general maintenance and upkeep that, um, as well as that, there's um, yeah, the general maintenance and upkeeps of their venues. Um, and as well as that, it's just that there is so much in terms of like corporate competition for grassroots live music venues, you know. Um, so we launched the other day at the Lexington, which is, you know, a fantastic independently run venue. Um, but many, many touring artists now uh, are looking at, say, all of these venues, which are, you know, named after huge corporate sponsors like O2. Uh, you know, there's energy companies, there's like... Uh, um, you know, gambling companies and there's all sorts of, uh, you know, they, that's where the real investment is in the British live music sector at the minute. And unfortunately, that means that these grass music venues with incredible heritage and history, um, you know, we, we've lost many over the time, be it the Hacienda in Manchester, the cockpit in Leeds. Um, they've struggled to stay afloat. They do not have that same level of corporate backing. And that is where uh, up and coming artists and unsigned bands are, you know, they, they, there's just not really a sustainable market for them as things stand. And that's what we're trying to build. Um, so why do you think that grassroots local music venues are so important? Well, it's simply because it's an expression of, 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 you know, local feeling, isn't it? Um, so people, people can come together um, to be around their communities. Like so many artists are inspired by their surroundings, um, you know, and they've also, many artists, some of the biggest names of today have started off playing in tiny clubs and pubs in their towns. That's how they've got their gigs. That's how they've got noticed. Without the grassroots live music venues, um, it, you know, in every corner of the country, um, we just, you know, we risk losing out on an entire generation and and beyond of of talent, of names, of like, and it's 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 a waste, um, you know. Um, so many, there's so many. What we were so lucky to have the other day at the Lexington when we launched is three young up and coming bands um, who have got their break through playing small venues in their towns. Hot Wax, who played from Hastings, uh, Juices uh, from Northwest London. Uh, and Diamond Country Dance Club from from St Neots, which is a little town near where I'm from in Cambridgeshire. Um, you know, those are people who are making their name on the live touring scene 
in their towns and in the surrounding area and building up that base and that following, which will take them on to bigger and better things. Without these small live music venues and pubs and clubs, where where's where where do they get noticed? Where do they you know make their name? That's the real risk we're facing without securing the long term economic future of that particular part of the economy. So you mentioned earlier some of the specific venues that have already been lost. You mentioned like the Hacienda and other places. Are there particular venues right now that um, that you're concerned are, are under particular threat or that Music for the Many is planning on campaigning to save? So since we announced the campaign, we've been in uh, and in great conversation with a number of music venues and there will be future Music for Many dates we're looking to uh, announce in, in due course. Um, the, the campaign uh, sort of was started when we went for a meeting with the lead mill in Sheffield, uh, sort of, I think it was in sort of the middle of last year. Um, they're, they're, they're obviously a, a historic music venue of a great heritage and history. People like Pulp, Arctic Monkeys played gigs there. Um, their challenges are different. They, uh, they're they more sort of to do with like their issues being with like landlords and like changing of like their sort of like level of the contract. But we've had conversations with uh, the lead mill and that sort of has inspired that as of the next parts of the campaign and we've consulted with a number of organizations and a number of venues many have actually reached out to us since we announced the campaign as well so there's some really good ongoing conversations um but we, the, the there is people can can check it out um the music venues trust uh, regularly publish a list of what they're calling at risk music venues um where there has been great fundraising campaigns the lexington was very recently uh, a part of that list um and was in the top 10 most at risk venues in the country which when you consider uh, its its location in london when you like you know how populated that area is and like you know the great names and regular events they have there it should never be in that situation but obviously in terms of paying overheads in terms of like economic challenges we mentioned earlier that's how they've come to that position but if you yeah music venues trust do publish a list and there are names up and down the country they have their own separate campaign going but we've looked at their annual report uh we've looked at their recommendations and we're looking at continuing those conversations with music venues and music venues trust going forwards to sort of consult the next steps of where we plan to take the tour basically and so one you you talked there about the lead mill and the specific circumstances there and that's an interesting dynamic in this because i think you know when when we hear about loss of music venues we often hear about you know the economic things that you talked about but there's also a load of other factors at play that you know uh relationship with landlords uh there's often like issues of gentrification that impact on live music venues where um you know high-end flats get built opposite a music venue and then you get a series of noise complaints and all those kinds of things that has led to the losses of various music venues um what impact do you think those kinds of things are having on the kind of independent live music venues we have in the uk and is that something that you folks are going to be campaigning on well certainly i think it'd be hard to say that that, that doesn't i mean like gentrification has had its an impact on the creative sector for decades you know, like people, genuine creative spaces have been lost in the name of sort of commercialization. That's a problem all around the world here in, in the UK, uh, the United States as well, um, particularly that, you know, the areas of like Soho in, in New York was particularly in the 60s and 70s famed for being such a creative space. Pricey apartments and, and, and tower blocks were built around it and that, that connection was lost. Um, there's a real risk in this country too of things of things going that way. I think we have a lot of great sort of people and artists who are willing to camp who are campaigning sort of you know in, against that. And certainly we, as as the uh, Peace and Justice Project's Music for the Many, um, you know we certainly do support keeping that c connection to the local area. You know ensuring that there is a fairness, ensuring that local people you know receive you know the, what you know the the, the the rewards of having that creativity on their doorstep and like the nurturing that goes into that um it's it's not directly part of one of the campaigns it's a it's a huge campaign to undertake and sort of the spirit of the uh the campaign is to keep things as local as possible um and support those particular local areas um and you know do what we can i mean we're still very lucky to be in like the sort of shaping part of the campaign and i think since we announced it and the amount of people that have reached out to us on a whole number of issues um it, it sort of has like brought into like how much 
the, the, the music uh, and entertainment industry is up against it. And gentrification is certainly one of those challenges that, you know, we we will be looking at, I think. Um, but now we're in the in the process of building it and sort of like looking at the futures of uh, the direct at risk futures of music venues, first of all. And before I kind of ask you to talk about how people can get involved, I guess um, one final question for you is that obviously you talked at the start about the role of smaller independent local music venues in the kind of ecology of the art sector and the music industry. So the reality is that you've got yeah the big O2 venues and the the the, the corporate sponsor venues which only can exist because you have a thriving local small independent venue scene because that's where musicians and artists ply their trade it's where they you know are able to build up a following build up a big enough following to play the bigger venues and so on um but i guess the the existence of small uh or rather the threats to smaller venues is just one of the challenges that the music industry is facing right now in terms of the ability for smaller artists to break through when you've got you know the the impact of <clears throat> uh the streaming giants and the tiny pittance that they they pay in terms of royalties when you've got um you know the impact of brexit post-brexit regulations on touring in the european union um how do you think that the the issue of loss of music venues fits into that wider piece of the the challenge of being i guess a, a touring musician a live musician a musician generally today I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it, it, there, there are people in a better place to advise on how it's as in, in the music industry to advise on how it's impacted things like touring, you know, things like uh, the documentation required to go into Europe or, or abroad. Um, I think that but the, the, what the UK has going for it uh, is that it has always been seen as being a, a, a place in terms of creativity, in terms of touring where artists do want to come and play. And that's great. The problem we have here, though, is that it's 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 artists, you know, who we want to be up and coming from our own towns and cities as well um, that aren't getting that sort of like fair share. So when a huge band from the States or Australia comes over that, you know, chances are if, they've, if they're touring from the US or Australia, then they've made the name for themselves and they're going to be playing a huge venue, aren't they? They're going to be playing the O2 or Wembley Arena or, or you know, venues of, of thousands and thousands in size. Um, I think that in itself and the streaming certainly I think is an interesting sort of thing in terms of artists getting their name out there and I think it was it was uh John from Reverend and the Makers made a very good post about this on Twitter the other day about how many times you'd actually have to listen to an album um for an artist to actually make any money from it and it's it's it yeah it's it's they pay something like 0 0.003 cents or something per stream of a song and that in itself is a, is a, is a challenge to break down, and maybe that's uh, um, something that we can all, I think, take on together later on down the line because that is hugely unfair, and it no doubt does impact the airplay um, or like you know artists getting their names out there, and you know having being a full time musician can't really be a possibility. Um, unless you are making a lot of money from touring, and that's where music for the many sort of is raising the issue that people just simply aren't able to do that if we don't have the venues for them to make a name for themselves and 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 to start um i'm not sure whether or not that fully answered your question but i think what it, it certainly ha does highlight is that there are a number of challenges um and we, we even even as as you said we we even as a campaign are learning them as we go we have we've had a great response to it people have been getting in touch with us and highlighting their own issues in their own towns uh you know in terms of their own venues and them being in bands or trying to you know get a song out there it's 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 incredibly difficult and i think if we do not act the the real risk is that we lose a a phenomenal part of our history as a country and our, also our future i want you know to live in a world where people who have that creativity and that ambition can go on and do what they want to do and sort of spread their you know share their talent and their gifts with the world and i think that it, you know i think there there there's so many problems in the world at the minute and i get to some people and this has actually been part of the response that we've had you know is that people do turn to us and they have said you know but what about this well and that's true and that's so true but you know that we need to try and fight to keep you know people's hopes alive music can, and this was a big part of the launch as well is that people have been inspired by music over time 
we had great speakers at our event as well from Love Music Hate Racism. We had a speaker from Just Stop Oil. We had a speaker from The Name Game. And each one of those campaigns uh, is about uniting people, about raising awareness of issues of, say, discrimination or, or, or the challenges people face or the climate crisis. Each of those are important issues. And there's a place for music to unite people around those issues. And that is again in the spirit of the campaign. And that's why I think it's important we take it forwards. Music is a thing that can unite us and it can unite us over those issues too. And so then finally, how can people get involved with the campaign? Sure, people can get involved if they, so we're Peace and Justice Project on all social media platforms are at the Peace and Justice Project, apart from on Twitter where we're at Corbyn underscore project. Um, they can also get involved by visiting the Corbyn Project.com. Um, where and if they Corbyn Project.com forward slash action, if they wanted to get involved and join our mailing list to find out and like get exclusives on like what's coming up on the campaign next, there's a place to do that. But it will all be across the social media platforms. Please do also email us on info at the Corbyn Project.com. Uh, if you want to get involved in the campaign, if you've got any suggestions or if you want to raise an issue in your local area to do with music venues or anything else, any other injustice, we'll take it. Um, <laughs> then, yeah, please do. Fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us today, Samuel. Thank you. Thank you for having me.